Jackal among snakes author, Nemorosus. Chapter 91, Dependent Thought. Argrave awoke feeling refreshed. Sleep had come easier than he expected it to, at the very least. His body could sleep when he needed to. All of that changed when he tried to move. At once, his legs and back groaned, sore and wicky from the intense yesterday. His shoulders felt bruised from the backpack, his feet still vaguely protested, and his thighs and calves were both taxed beyond compare. He tried to sit up, but even his core was sore. Jesus, he huffed while leaning up. He felt something stuck in his throat and coughed. His cough was wet and unpleasant, and after he'd finished hacking, he spent some time clearing his throat. He was only able to breathe normally again after he pounded his chest. You okay? Annalise asked. Argrave looked up at her. She had a book in her lap as she leaned up against the wall. She looked a mess, just as Argrave felt. Her long white hair was braided tightly, yet still dirtied and matted. I'm fine, Argrave waved his hand. Just my throat, I think. Probably slept with my mouth open. Annalise nodded. Rare for me to wake before you. Wish it would happen more often, frankly, Argrave said, rubbing his eyes. Any notable occurrences, Glimmon? He raised his head, looking towards the doorway. Nothing I could hear. Gave up on the smelling. Useless here, the debased blood of the guardians consumes that sense, he answered, returning to his usual brevity. All right. Argrave raised himself to his feet, and a piece of a broken shelf that had stuck to his clothes fell off him, clattering against the stone. Part of me wishes someone would just break down the door. Kill off some of the uncertainty, at the very least. It's tempting to think like that, Glement stood. Spent two days in a glacial cave, once hiding out from enemies after things. Went awry. Wanted nothing more than to do something stupid, force something to happen. You can't, though. I know. Argrave sighed. All right. We have quite a conundrum on our hands. The way I see it kept me up a long while, thinking about how I was going to pull my head free of this vice before it slammed shut, given the circumstances. Perhaps the aforementioned diplomacy with the vampires would be our best option, Annalise posited. I'm not sure they know three of their own died at our hands. Glimmon looked ready to protest. But Argrave interjected himself before he could do so. I don't really care to find out what the vampires know. Argrave shook his head. My overconfidence landed us in this situation in the first place. We left ourselves in the hands of a greater power, and this greater power proved to be unreasonable. The same might happen again, and I doubt we'd have an easy go escaping from vampires. Glimmon nodded contentedly, and Annalise looked to have no rebuttal. Argrave stepped away, placing his hand on the shelf blocking the door. He drummed his fingers on it, lost in thought, with a sudden realization. He frowned and turned round. I'm doing it again, he said in annoyance, planning on my own, seeking no advice. The two said nothing but did not meet Targrave's gaze, that, alone, told him that he was right in what he said. All right, let me lay down some things we might be able to use to force either side's hands. Hash. A man wearing a crimson set of patchwork robes stared through a set of thick iron bars, one hand held against a bar for support. His face looked locked in a permanent scowl, and when coupled with his bald head, he strongly resembled a vulture. His eyes were cold and hazed, resembling a set one might find on a corpse. The bars he stood before were each as thick as the man himself, and the metal shone with dancing light. Enchantments. They were wide enough to accommodate entry. Though the area the man resided in was filthy, stained with blood and battered by debris, the area beyond the bars was pristine. It shone with golden light from chandeliers dangling from the rafters even now, illuminating a decadent library shrouded by a thick haze of dust. The man reached a hand through the bars, and once it reached the halfway point, his fingers bent as though meeting an invisible wall. He kept pushing his hand forward until his fingers formed a fist, and then he pulled his hand back, punching. His skin shook, impacting against something invisible. The man did not blink or breathe, staring at his hand. He raised a nail up, scratching at the barrier between the metal bars, though his nails slid along what was blocking passage. No sound came, as though what he scratched was immaterial. The faintest sound echoed out in the room and the man quickly turned his head towards it. A necklace of stone roses dangled from his neck, numbering three. Who? The man called out, voice almost a bestial growl. It's visor, Namara. Another slowly walked into the room, taking his place just behind Namara. He had a shrew-like look to him. What? Namara questioned sharply, turning his head back to the bars before the library. A group of stone apatal sentinels have encamped out front the headquarters. MMM. Namara uttered voice a low rasp. Their reason? Visor shook his head. Unknown. They're watching the entrance. Their leader is Ossian. Ossian, Namara repeated. The unpredictable one. Some people heard a noise, Visor said, walking up beside the bars. Thunder. They said. Only a few heard it. Where? Namara questioned. Visor clasped his hands together. Within. And neither Raid, Ardis, nor Gavin have returned. No coincidence. Namara said. He finally turned away from the metal bars. Some vigor returned to his eyes. Something's in here with us. But that's something. The stone apatal sentinels are looking for it. None of the others know, said Visor. We can move before they do. And do what, exactly? Countered Namara, voice a disdainful snarl. No. 
We need no complications. Send one of our own out. Rouse the blood of some of the guardians. Lure the creatures inside. Have them flood the upper levels. We'll wipe away the dirt with a tide of flesh and blood. Dot it may be difficult to emerge from hiding in a timely fashion, Visor countered, wringing his hands tightly. If we lure guardians, those things will settle inside the higher floors. They'll need to be purged once more. Centuries we've stayed, our numbers dwindling more and more as the years pass by. It's intolerable. Namar a glanced at Visor. See it done. Use someone reliable, someone used to trekking in the low way. The sentinel, the intruders. Let them succumb. Visor nodded obediently, then walked away. Namara turned back towards the metal bars, staring at the library beyond. Hash. So, it's decided. Argrave nodded. He sat atop a crate, speaking to Annalise and Gilliman. We're headed into the heart of the vampire's territory, the lower levels. I don't like it. Gilliman shook his head. But I dislike this entire situation. It's the best option. And our first genuine group decision, Argrave said with a positive spin. Won't exactly be easy to get inside. Argrave reached into his back pocket and pulled free a medallion bearing an owl on the front. Remember this? Gave one to you, Annalise. Annalise nodded. I do. It is a badge signifying membership to the Order of the Grey Owl. It allows one inside the Tower of the Grey Owl or its subsidiary branches in various cities. Glad you have an understanding. Argrave stowed his badge away. The important thing is that it links to your magic fingerprint. This tradition of using one's magic signature. It wasn't started by the Order of the Grey Owl. So, Annalise mused, placing a finger on her chin. Dot the lower levels require a badge of that sort, just the same as the Grey Owl. Not quite, Argrave raised a finger. The Order of the Rose had a more primitive system. The doors themselves only open to those with a magical signature recognized by the Order of the Rose. All of the vampires are apprentices from the Order of the Rose, hence, they have access. Then we need only capture a vampire alive, Glamon crossed his arms. I suppose we could, Argrave nodded. He had not been considering that as an option because it didn't exist in the game. Another bit of evidence towards his limited perspective and another reason he was glad he had sought out his companion's perspective. Hell, that might be the better option. The way I had intended. You remember those screaming heads on a stake at Thorngorge Citadel? Argrave pointed at the two of them. The ones we should not kill, Glamour nodded. There's this place called the Menagerie of Morbidity on the upper levels. There's a lot of creatures out on display, grandiose abominations displaying alleged necromantic achievements. Most of them are pretty disturbing, he admitted. Gaze lingering on Annalise. One of them is a screaming head made of a wizard that used to belong to the Order of the Rose. His magical signature is fully intact, as is his cognition. Glamour frowned and looked towards Annalise. That sounds a bit ridiculous, he eventually said. Annalise nodded in agreement. When put to examination, Argrave supposed they had a good point. This screaming head was a key item the player needed to access more of the headquarters. The player needed a way to progress. After all, it was an item of convenience placed solely for the sake of the game. Such conveniences would not exist in common reality, surely, but then, this had become his reality, and most other things remained the same. Argrave's head spun as he tried to wrap his head around it, realizing he let a silence hang in the air for far too long, he quickly said, I mean, we can probably just try and capture one of the vampires, but I think this should work. Not used to you lacking confidence, Glamour noted. Be plain. Do you think this is worth the risk compared to the prospect of capturing a vampire alive? Yeah, Argrave shrugged. You saw the way those three were almost frenzied, unreasonable, and still dangerous despite all of that. Argrave tapped his finger against his leg, thinking. But with the menagerie, there's Annalise to consider, can't imagine the sights will be easy on her, what with her empathic talents. Annalise shook her head in quick protest. Thank you for your consideration, Argrave, but I refuse to be a hindrance. Even still, I'd like to know what waits within this menagerie of morbidity before I make a decision. Argrave nodded in understanding leaning back on the crate he sat on. A lot of the things within out locked up, or they've already been killed. The rest. Their imitations of grand alive, Argrave described as best he could, are the ones still alive. There's a wyvern, a mammoth, various types of big cat. Argrave tried counting, but he realized the list was growing quite long and waved his hand. Too many to list, but they're all malformed, each and every creation corrupted. The magic used to create them was imperfect, and they've morphed over the years into terrible things. Of course. They're locked away. I doubt there will be much trouble. Best yet. There's edible things there. We can replenish our food supply, if only just. Argrave waited as they both thought over what he'd said. Capture a vampire, or head into a necromancer's zoo. Neither seemed particularly fun options, but this was the hand they'd been dealt. He would be fine with either, as fine as he could be, at least. Considering the noise we made yesterday. It may be difficult to actually find a vampire, let alone capture alive, Annalise posited. Though I am not fond of saying this. I believe we should head into the menagerie. Glamour? Argrave gestured. You're fine with this? I. he nodded. We should probably move quickly. No telling how things will proceed. Right. Argrave agreed, lowering himself down from atop the crate he sat on. Let's get going. Chapter 92 
menagerie of morbidity. Gorman had his hands on the handles of a turn wheel. As he turned it, a heavy iron gate rose upwards, the sound of chains echoing out into the spacious central lobby. Argrave kneeled low, trying to peer into the opening that appeared to little effect. The place beyond was dark. Argrave gave up and turned around, peering out down to the first floor of the headquarters of the Order of the Rose. He felt exposed in the open place, having grown used to the constancy of the stone walls in the room they'd slept. There, Gleman finished with a grunt, looking up at the iron gate which hung suspended. Argrave turned around. Nothing. Lurking out there, right? Gleman took his hands off the wheel and moved to look around. After ten or so seconds, he nodded. Nothing near. But still. Be cautious. Don't want you freezing up as you did last time if I missed something. Nor do I, Argrave agreed, stepping forth. The magic light he'd conjured to light the way followed with him, illuminating some beyond. Annalise evidently felt the light was insufficient, for she conjured a spell of much grander light. A ball traveled forth from her hand, dispelling the darkness. The menagerie of morbidity lived up to the morbid part of its name at once. Compared to the lobby, where one might see the occasional body of a guardian or the ivory stalks left behind by the destroyed flesh plants that illuminated the area. This place was quite intense. Despite being a bit ominous, the entrance was quite a stunning sight. The skeletal remains of a dragon hung down from the railings of the second floor of the menagerie, cracked and decayed but nonetheless glorious. A tree with red, oak-like leaves grew out from its left eye socket. Dozens of other skeletons surrounded the dragon's corpse. Some bore rotten crimson robes and were decidedly humanoid. Others consisted only of a skull and two arms protruding from where the ears might have been. The remains of some guardians of the low way. The place was wrecked far more so than the other areas of the low way. The tile was cracked, both from battle and from growth. Moss covered most of the floor beyond the entrance, ranging in color from purple to blue to red. Trees with red leaves filled up much of the place, at times so dense it was difficult to tell they were inside a building. Their roots disturbed the stone, making the path uneven and awkward. Some of them had white berries growing from their branches. The fruits had rings on the bottom, making them look a bit like eyes from a distance. This is why I didn't eat, Argrave said stepping up slowly and pulling a berry from a tree. He put it in his mouth and chewed. He hadn't been sure what to expect. But it actually tasted quite pleasant. Then again, after the day he'd had yesterday, anything would likely taste pleasant. Are you sure that? Annalise trailed off when Argrave swallowed. Pretty good, actually. Kind of like. Grapefruit, I guess, but less tangy. Argrave pulled a few more off. Annalise watched with obvious concern. I do not know what grapefruit is. When Argrave swallowed another, she quickly said. Maybe you should not eat so many. It's safe. Don't worry, Argrave assured. Argrave held his hands out, the white fruits balanced atop his bony palm. Try some. Every bit helps. Besides, we don't want to cut into our rations too deeply. I, Annalise said hesitantly, staring at the berries. I think I will stick to a preserved meat. Do not be frivolous, Argrave, Glimmon said. The gate. I think it would be best to leave it open, even if it might attract attention. Argrave considered that. Let's break it down. Even if someone discovers it which is unlikely, who says there to assume it's us. Better to leave the possibility of speedy exit open. In my estimation, Argrave nodded. Both agreed with his assessment of the situation, then spent their time examining the surroundings. Seems a straightforward path, Glimmon noted. For now, it is. Argrave nodded, peering out into the crimson forest beyond. It opens up into a grander area later, much more open. Do you have an idea why there are so many of the guardians of the low way dead here? Annalise questioned, noticing the abundance of their corpses laying about because the guardians and the things within the menagerie aren't exactly allies. Argrave pushed one with his toe. This place. Uncomfortably crowded, a lot of places to hide. Argrave looked ahead. We should probably be more cautious than normal. Glimmon stepped ahead without a word, proceeding in silence. Argrave followed just after him, and Annalise took the rear. This place was much more difficult to traverse than even Nordr made. The growth of moss and plants made the strain of walking less on the back and feet, but the uneven terrain made watching one step paramount. Twisting an ankle would be less terrible than on earth because of the presence of healing magic, but Argrave still did not wish to use magic for something that was ostensibly easily avoidable. Argrave and his companions walked through the red forest in single file. Though the berries had only vaguely resembled eyes from the entrance, inside the forest, Argrave got the chilly feeling that a thousand gazes were on him at once. Argrave tried eating more of the berries to dispel that feeling, but the taste was ruined when he perceived them as eyeballs and he found them a little more difficult to swallow. They passed by many stone cells with the corpses of creatures within. It was difficult to perceive what exactly they were. The things within the menagerie of morbidity had been made of human parts. Because of the imperfect spell used in their creation, they slowly morphed back into the shape they had been molded from. They would see the body of a tiger, for instance, yet the head had been morphed back into an arm or leg. Even as bone, it was a disturbing sight. Sound started to echo out across the crimson forest of the menagerie, 
and eventually, the stone cells housed the still living. A great black bull huffed at them as they passed by, the horns on its head morphed into two skeletal arms that moved with an apparent will of their own. The creature approached the steel bars that held it, and the two arms reached out, bony fingers grasping the bars as any human prisoner might. It unsettled our grave more than he cared to admit, and he did not feel at ease walking by it. He checked behind him at times to be sure Annalise was coping, and she seemed stable enough. Sounds and smells grew more intense as they proceeded, ape-like noises, barking, yelping. It was enough that each and every step was ever more uncertain. The smell of rot made our grave nauseous. The hallway they had been traveling on opened, and the forest of red trees thinned, opening into a large room. Cages were placed equidistantly throughout the grand room, holding up the place like pillars. Though many malformed animals made noises from within their cages, the centerpiece drew our grave's attention at once. A wyvern lay within. Though it was normally proportioned, where it might have had scales, veiny skin covered instead. Uneven patches of hair grew at random portions with varying colors and lengths. Cuts and scratches marred its body, many of them leaking pus. Seeing it now, he was certain it was the strongest smell in the room. Argrave grabbed at his throat, feeling like something was rising. Fortunately, he managed to suppress it. Glimmon kneeled, casting his eyes about the room to be sure nothing was amiss. A dog-like animal of indeterminable species barked at them, and Argrave felt like every animal locked in this room was watching them. Argrave leaned on Glimmon's shoulder. Maybe we don't need to go so slow he suggested, only half in jest. Don't see anything out of sorts, but... Hard to hear. Hard to smell, Glimmon reported. Then... Argrave pressed. Then we proceed. Cautiously. Glimmon looked up at him, white eyes shining within his helmet. Where do we head next? That hallway over there, Argrave pointed out. Right side. We follow it until the end. Whether we weave through the cages or follow along the wall. I'll leave it to you. Glimmon nodded, rising to his feet. Along the wall. The elven vampire stepped forward. The animals watched them as they passed. They passed by the monkeys. Their tails had turned into human arms, which made their movements awkward and jerky. They screeched horribly as the three of them passed. The sight that made Argrave most uneasy, though, was an empty cage. Its bars had split like something had burst out from the cage. Though moving through the area was unbearable, it passed quickly and without escalation. They entered the second hallway moving along to the end of the line. This place was much more open than the entryway and largely free of obscuring vegetation, which assuaged some of Argrave's fears. This place was the personnel's branch of the menagerie, if Argrave recalled correctly. Ends not too far. Third on the left, Argrave eventually broke the silence. Glimmer nodded, and Annalise let out a sigh of relief. They proceeded upwards, and Argrave stopped them at the door. It was made of iron and largely intact, though spots near the doorknob had rusted. All right, let me do the talking, he whispered. Talking? Annalise repeated, confused, is someone in there? Don't be loud, Argrave said, lowering his hand as though urging her to lower her volume. I told you that the head we're looking for retained its cognition, right? And the ability to use magic? You said it retained its magic signature, not its ability to use magic. She whispered back, a bit louder, I'm sorry, all right? Argrave apologized, it's not that big of a threat, honest. I didn't consider it because it's not worthy of consideration. She stared at him with mouth agape like he was a fool. Come on, no use dwelling on this. He tried to dismiss. Let's just get ready. Annalise looked at the door, face taut, while Argrave pushed his tongue against his cheek. All right. Now's a good time to test out the B-rank awards conjured by our rings, I suppose. I'll use mine when we pass through the door, Gilliman. Argrave gestured towards the doorknob. The elf reached a hesitant hand out and turned the doorknob slowly. He made sure Argrave was prepared with a ring, and then swung the door open. With will alone, Argrave conjured the B-rank ward before the door had even left his vision. A semi-visible golden shield filled his vision at once. He had expected to see a room beyond it. Instead, a blinding flash of light filled his vision as flames hurtled towards them. Argrave could not help but jump back. The golden B-rank ward stayed strong, though, and the flames hurtled upwards. The fire battered against the ceiling, floor, and walls. They continued for a great length of time, and then slowly began to diminish. Once they had faded, what was left beyond was a scorched mess of the room. At the center of it, untouched by anything, stood a stake. This stake had a head atop it. You bastards had a trick, I see, the head said. Nice to meet you, Argrave said, stepping forth through his ward despite the earlier display of power. He remained ready to jump back at a moment's notice. We got off on the wrong foot, I think, but we have much to discuss. The head squinted. Chapter 93 Heads and tails. The severed head stared at them warily from its position atop a stake. Despite the utterly destroyed room around it, where every wall had been scorched black from fire and other spells, both the stake and the head were unblemished. They were shielded by a sheening ward that Argrave knew was relatively low ranking. The head itself had quite an ordinary appearance, once one looked past the disembodied part. It seemed young, with mostly smooth white skin and short brown hair. His expression had a general air of arrogance and defensiveness, though perhaps that came from the situation it was in. 
His eyes were black and gold, like most other creatures born of the Order of the Rose. You. The head's brown eyes moved up and down, sizing Argrave up. Show me your teeth. Argrave complied, pulling back his gums. After a moment, he let his lips fall back into place. They're nice and pearly white, none of them sharper than they need to be. Then who are you? The head asked. Why are you here? Are those elves? I am Argrave. He placed a hand to his chest. And who are you? I'm. Its eyes rolled back into its head. It stayed silent for a long while, and Argrave shifted on his feet patiently. Dot that's who? It said suddenly, eyes drawn back to attention. And you? You're. His gaze flitted back between Annalise and Argrave. Both of you are wearing the same thing. A uniform. You're part of a group, it said accusingly. Argrave was taken aback for a moment, and he spared a glance at Annalise. Indeed, just as Argrave did. She wore grey leather gear covered by a duster. You're part of a group exploring the grand city of Nordmaid. I get it. It licked its lips. Your pillagers, come to wrench free the knowledge of the late great Order of the Rose. It spat angrily. You're no different from the bloodlappers. You're. Shut up for a minute, Argrave interrupted, holding a finger out. You can't even remember your name. Do you even know your own situation? Of course I can remember my name. It shouted out. I'm. Its eyes rolled back into its head again. And your arms, your legs. Hell, your whole body. Argrave spoke to it despite its trance-like state. Where is it all? Think about it. Break free of your mental constraints. Remember who you were. Its eyes twitched, its face scrunched up, and its lower lip began to spasm. Think long and hard, Argrave said insistently, stepping further past his ward. Who are you? What did you do? Why are you here? It opened its eyes again, its face scrunched up in fear as it stared at Argrave with bloodshot eyes. Blood started to trickle down its face like tears. Your breathing, your heart beat. You can't feel them. Can you? You're not paralyzed. They're just not there, Argrave said smoothly, as though trying to hypnotize. The head started to spasm and twitch as it gazed up at Argrave. Glamon tried to stop Argrave from advancing further, but he shrugged off the elf's grip. I'll say it again, Argrave said, standing just before the head. Who are you? The head ground its teeth together, veritably growling at Argrave. You weren't always just a head on a stake, Argrave said conclusively. The head's eyes widened, and all its movements stopped. Then, its face sagged as though it had fallen asleep. The ward surrounding it dissipated, the magic shattering like glass. Argrave held his hand to his chest and let out a sigh of relief. Nerve-wracking, he muttered to himself. Argrave dispelled the B-rank ward so that Annalise and Gilliman could enter the room. Annalise stepped forward cautiously, arms crossed. Is it over? What happened to it? I saw immeasurable distress, and then... Nothing. It's breaking free of the magic that kept it servile, Argrave explained. It... No... He should wake up in a few minutes. I would advise plugging your ears when it does so. Argrave was quite relieved that it worked. He had recited what the player said to the head in game. It had worked out in Vaiden when he talked to Driz, and now it worked out once again. To be frank, he wasn't entirely sure his memory of the dialogue was spot on, but he got the gist of it right, and it worked out. Would something like this be possible for others? Annalise inquired. Perhaps it was Argrave's imagination, but he detected some hopefulness in her tone. He felt the answer was no but he gave the truth. I don't know, Argrave shook his head. He stared at her amber eyes as she turned away, quietly nodding and accepting his information. How are you handling this place? She looked at him and gave a faint smile that had some bitterness beneath it. Let us say simply I will be glad to put it behind us. Argrave nodded. You and me both. Glamon shut the iron door. Argrave used the time that the severed head was inanimate to settle his frayed nerves and catch his breath. It was strangely hard to breathe, and his chest felt tight. It was probably because of where they were. He reasoned, even with all the foliage in Nordmaid, it did not change the fact that they were underground. Annalise, once more, took the time to read her B-rank spellbook. Her diligence had been especially high in recent days. Argrave assumed there was a spell that caught her interest. He kept his eye on the head on a stake. When a few minutes had passed, it stirred, and Argrave was the first to greet it. Hey, you, you're finally awake, Argrave greeted, standing just in front of it. The newly and truly awakened head looked up at Argrave. It blinked for a few moments. Without so much as a word of warning, it let out a deafening scream. Argrave had been well prepared, and had his hands already placed over his ears. Annalise heeded his warning and had done the same. Gilliman, though, took a step back and frowned in annoyance. He screamed for a very long while, he had no lungs, after all, and his voice born of magic could last near forever. Argrave might have casted a ward to muffle him, but that might have earned his ire and the iron door muffled the sound well enough that nothing outside would come to investigate. After a long while, its abject terror settled into a panic-ridden mess of curses, obscenities, and general confusion. When the head became aware that there were three people in the room with it, it sought out answers. Argrave spent a long while trying to console it, offering calming words while trying his very best to ignore the oddity of the scenario. Who? It breathed out. God damn it all. That bastard Makaid. He got me. He got me. God damn it all. It said face scrunched up as though it were about to cry. So, who
Who are you people? What in the God's name do I do next? Considering that everyone you've ever known is dead, the Order of the Rose is entirely defunct, and you haven't left this place in, oh, six hundred years. Our grave guest Trolley, I think it's about time we get you out of this place, for your health if nothing else. The head looked overwhelmed. Hash. Ossian. A knight shook the man he mentioned, and the master sentinel was immediately roused. What's happened? Ossian said immediately, already awake. He sat up from the cold stone floor, rising to his feet quite adeptly despite the plate mail armor he wore. Report, he commanded. There's a huge swarm of guardians headed this way. Biggest I've ever seen. The man stood with Ossian, walking towards the doorway and exiting into the city of Nordmaid. Ossian followed, and then stepped outside. The knight pointed off to the distance. The guardians of the low way stormed through the city like monkeys, leaping from building to branch adeptly, barring the noise of their metal weapons scraping against the stone of the city. Their approach was soundless. Gods, Ossian breathed out. How was this missed? He demanded, stepping forward. Gather everyone, he commanded swiftly. They were two separate groups, sir and moving away from us, chasing something. They converged, and, I told you to pay attention for anything odd, Ossian said angrily. The fact that they were chasing anything at all was an oddity. Gather everyone, he repeated, grabbing the knight's arm and pushing him away. Everyone moved frantically, waking those that were sleeping and retrieving those that were on watch. Before long, Ossian scanned the group, and seeing everyone was there, began giving commands. We have to move quickly. The group of guardians is too large to avoid completely. We go into the headquarters of the Order of the Rose, sir. One of the female spellcasters protested. We should hole up in a nearby building, prepare fortifications and traps, she recommended. Not enough people to resist that wave. Ossian shook his head quickly. No arguments. Spaces are confined there, but there's still room to move. Even if the vampires are there, they are enemies to the guardians just as much as we are. Now, let's move, he repeated, shouting. Ossian was the first to move, pushing past and heading down a flight of stairs that led to the headquarters. The others obediently followed even the woman who disagreed. All that knew well enough that to disobey orders in the low way meant to potentially cause the deaths of all. Hash. Argrave watched as many of the stone apatal sentinels swarmed into the entrance. He, Gilliman, and Annalise were all on the second story. Argrave held the severed head like a staff, and now he used it to support himself as he kneeled. They had very nearly walked down the stairs, but Gilliman heard something coming and moved them to a safer location where they could watch without being seen. Argrave and Annalise had dispelled their lighting spells, but the spellcasters in the Sentinel's company lit the place up with their own. They're being chased, Glimmon commented. A swarm of guardians. We should move back inside the menagerie, lower the gate. It should be sufficient toward them. Who are those people? The head atop the stake in Argrave's grip asked. Friends of yours? No, they, Argrave cut himself off. I suppose they could be. You are not thinking of? Annalise looked at Argrave. I am thinking of it, Argrave nodded. I find people are much more amenable to suggestion when they're in a desperate situation. We can help them, lead them into the menagerie. We win them to our side, everything goes back to the way it should have. He looked back at Gilliman and Annalise. Thoughts? Their leader. The one called Ossian, if I remember right, Gilliman contributed as he watched. Don't remember much hostility from him. They might grow suspicious, considering how fortunate this timing is for us, Annalise reasoned. And, once more, we surrender ourselves before power. Good points, both, Argrave nodded, at 20, just about. I think I can take them if I use Earl of Nipower. But I wanted to save that. Won't be able to use the blessing of supersession for the rest of this venture if I do. He sighed. I'm leaning towards helping them. But I won't do it unless you two give me the okay. Learned my lesson, I think. Gods. The headquarters of the Order of the Rose. Reduced to this, the head mused, looking about the ruined building. Annalise and Gilliman both glanced at the head. Then back at Argrave, Gilliman was the first to nod. Help against the vampires will be important, even with Erlebne at your back. This scenario is different from what occurred in their camp, Annalise nodded, agreeing. All right, Argrave took a deep breath. Guess I get a chance to salvage things. He handed the stake over to Annalise. Probably best if they don't see me holding a head, he reasoned, rising to his feet. Wish me luck, he said, about to move to the balcony. Good luck, said the head. He was the only one who did so. Chapter 94 Butting heads, Ossian stood at the doorway of the headquarters of the Order of the Rose, siphoning the last few members of his band inside the cold stone halls. He did not feel at ease being here, but the sight of the guardians of the low way moving through the ruined city of Nordmade made what little unease he had about the place negligible. Their escape had been speedy, so they had plenty of time before the abominations reached them. Ossian. He heard a voice echo out across the stone halls, and his head turned quickly, thinking it was one of the people in his party. Ossian's misunderstanding was quickly corrected though. Their very purpose for being here, Argrave of Blaggard, leaned out on the railings of the second floor, his face grimly illuminated from beneath by spell light from Ossian's group of spellcasters. How in hell did you manage to get that many guardians on your tail? Argrave questioned. Ossian stepped away from the doorway, 
wading through the crowd until he stood at the front of his group. He did not know what to say. He had not expected to meet Targrave in this manner, let alone at all. Guess it's not important. Listen, you probably came here for shelter, Argrave reasoned. I know of a place big enough and secure enough that even that horde outside won't be able to bother us. Despite all that's transpired between us, I can take you there. Where are your two menials? Ossian looked about. Menials? Argrave repeated, confused. I don't know what. Oh, he came to a realization. My companions are nearby. Ossian watched the man's eyes, trying to see if they would betray their location, but Argrave's gaze remained fixed ahead. There's no ambush, if that's what you're worried about. I should trust you. You killed one of our own. Ossian shouted out. You marked yourself an enemy to the stone apatal sentinels. Argrave lowered his gaze. I, I never wanted that to happen. We were just trying to enter the low way. Things were panicked, chaotic. You gathered men to attack me in my sleep, without any provocation whatsoever. He accused. Not attack. To confine you. Ossian shook his head, but did not rebut further. He had been against the idea from the beginning. But Alistair took liberties that could not be retracted. We don't have time to waste for this. Everyone, let's, just hold on. Argrave interrupted. I saw you coming. Could have avoided you, left you ignorant of my continued existence entirely. I don't want that. I have no ill will towards you or the Sentinels, despite what transpired. My stated goal remains my true goal, claiming the unsullied knife from the vampires. I've already got the key to entering the lower levels, where they reside. You called it the unbloodied blade before, Ossian noted quickly. Whatever, Argrave shook his head. If I'm right, the vampires have killed a lot more sentinels than I ever have, and theirs were purposeful. After we deal with that horde, we can put the vampires to the sword. The master sentinel shifted on his feet, sparing a glance back outside. You're taking a lot of liberties, Ossian said harshly. I know, and it's because I never wanted things to be like this. I have a lot of respect for each and every one of you. What happened? It's gutting, Argrave said, placing his hand near his chest. Give me the chance to right my wrong. Let me help you. We should move, sir, one of the knights said grabbing Ossian's shoulder. Ossian looked down at the ground, lost in deliberation. We outnumber them, but they've had plenty of time to prepare for our arrival. Could be walking into a trap. The horde behind us, could be something our grave forced to happen. But how would he be working with the vampires? Ossian dismissed the idea. No, that's ridiculous. The master sentinel looked up at our grave, trying to discern his motivations. Beyond eliminating enemies, our grave had little reason to see them dead. Indeed, things only started to deteriorate once Alistair moved against him. That said, his intent to use them as a cudgel against the vampires was quite obvious. He had stated as much, though in nicer terms. Is it so bad to be used, as long as things get done? The vampires have plagued the lower way for centuries. You could put an end to that. Be a damned hero. Ossian's vying heart spoke. Ossian broke free from the knight's grip on his shoulder and asked Argrave, Where is this holdout? Argrave smiled. Up here. There's a big iron gate, about a foot thick, operated by a turn wheel. Come up the stairs, follow me. Hash. Glamon lowered the large gate to the menagerie of morbidity, and it let out a loud sound when it met the stone, dust jumping up into the air. The party of stone apatal sentinels kept a cautious distance from our graves group. The hostility was all but tangible between them. This place is largely safe. I can't be sure there aren't some creatures roaming about within. This place is a menagerie. After all, our grave said, paying little attention to the tense atmosphere. But that iron door right there can surely hold back any guardians, even if they're smart enough to try the turn wheel. It's an easy enough task to keep the gate from moving. So these are my descendants? The head, still on its stake, spoke from Annalise's hands. What do they call themselves? Ossian looked to Annalise, who held the head. The stone apatal sentinels, Annalise answered. Oh, that's rich, the head said amusedly. I remember them. They were the border guard for the northern part of the low way, considering it was Vasco territory and safe as a chick in a coop. It was where they send the rejects and useless ones. Ossian's head turned back to Argrave some of his men bristling behind him. What is that thing? Why is it alive? It's not alive, technically, Argrave said. It's, I am Garm, youngest ever high wizard of the Order of the Rose. He introduced himself loudly. Now, I am a head on a wooden stake. Argrave nodded, stepping up to Annalise, adapting awfully quickly, I see. I have to, Garm said, raising his eyes to look at Argrave. Considering how long I was in there, your coming is the only opportunity I might get to escape this place. I have to be adaptable. Can't exactly walk, in case you haven't noticed. Can't even point a hand to emphasize that. Argrave pursed his lips, thinking. Garm. He set his hand on Garm's brown hair, turning back to Ossian. Is Arki into the lower levels of the headquarters, and in turn, where all of the vampires reside, he can get us into the inner levels of the headquarters, where actual members of the Order of the Rose reside. Garm looked very annoyed at Argrave's touch but could not exactly shake his hand off. All of the sentinels stood near the iron gate, facing Argrave and the three of them. Recognizing the rising tension, Argrave took his hand off Garm and faced them. They were greatly outnumbered, but Argrave did not feel fear. Even still, 
He kept the B-rank cording enchantment in his ring at the ready and kept the spellcasters in his vision. Tell me, Argrave stepped forward. Which way is the wind going to blow? Even if you've agreed to come here, now that we're standing in front of each other, a lot of things must be running through your head. You tell me, mind reader. Ossian crossed his arms. Argrave nodded at the jab, thinking his next words very carefully. What's transpired between us? I can say I never wanted it to happen, that I have nothing but respect for you. And you might believe me. Might not, Argrave reasoned. But I can say for sure that neither of us really want to fight right now. Coming to swords in a place like the Low Way. It's one of the Stone Epital Sentinel's least favorite things, if I know your group well enough. Why? Ossian said nothing, so Argrave continued. It's because down here, the true enemy, the enemy to us all, is the Low Way itself. Argrave pointed to the floor. Disunity ends in death. A group divided is easy prey to a predator. You aren't part of our unit, a female spellcaster said. You are the enemy. Can nothing be put to bed? Had I not done what I did, I'd be dead, or worse yet, bound in chains while your people did. Argrave threw up his hands. I don't know what you'd have done. I can say for certain I probably wouldn't have liked it. You were suspicious, Ossian said back. You knew too much about things. You travel with elves. That excuses things? Argrave questioned. Wasn't my call. Ossian retorted back. Alistair did it, without seeking approval from the other master sentinels. I didn't bring you here to cast blame, to point fingers. The whole situation was just an unfortunate tragedy, and one I'd prefer never happened. But you're here now. I didn't set a trap. I let you into this place that was food for weeks, a place that's completely safe from the Guardians outside. Lot of big risks on my part. We're only three, Argrave waved between everyone in his group. I'm not a person, you see, Garm added. I don't count. He's not, Argrave agreed deflating the head sarcasm. I won't act like I came here for some sightseeing or another such benign reason. I have a purpose. You know that purpose. The unsullied knife. That said, we can help each other. Ossian stared up at our grave, unblinking. Eventually, he turned his head away. I have to confer with my people. Give me some time. Sure, our grave agreed, though he did not feel entirely comfortable doing so. Persuading Ossian would be much simpler than winning the entire group over to his side, and he wasn't certain things would go in his favor after their conference. Annalise, Gilliman, and Argrave put some distance between them and the group of stone epital sentinels. Once they were far enough away not to be overheard, Argrave spoke. Garm, Argrave said. You said you were a high wizard once, right? Indeed. Youngest in history. Promising future, he said. Jealousy put an end to that. A tragic tale of woe. Dating, Argrave interrupted. Can you discern how much magic their spellcasters have? Garm didn't miss a beat in answering. They have one B rank, at best. The rest are all nothing. Argrave looked down at Garm. Nothing to you might be something to me. The other three are probably C rank, mid, I'd suppose. Silence stretched out, and Garm examined the other group, the stone apatal sentinels, once vagabonds and lackwits, now forming the last bastion of the order. They're a dim vestige of even dimmer glory. What a sad commentary. Okay, Argrave nodded. I think I can deal with them, should it come to that, saying that dredged up some uncomfortable nervousness. It would be stranger if he was eager to fight them, he supposed, but he did not enjoy the feeling. After a long time of uneasiness, Ossian broke off from the group walking up to Argrave. We can agree to cease hostilities, at least until this horde is gone. Ossian glanced back to his group. As for cooperating further, I think we'll need more time to decide that. That said, most of us are tired. We'd like to set up camp. Sure. Not like I own the floor. Argrave shrugged, then pointed to a relatively flat spot. The entrance is probably best. This place was a menagerie. Once, some creatures roamed deeper in. We didn't encounter any, but... Spare me the advice. Ossian held out a gauntleted hand. We'll decide on our own where to sleep. Facing such a distinct reminder of the lack of trust between the two of them, Argrave said nothing for a time. All right, sleep well, I guess. The berries are edible. Argrave pointed to a tree. I can eat some first, if you don't trust me. Ossian turned and walked away, leaving Argrave feeling dissatisfied and uneasy. Chapter 95, Moving Hearts of Stone the first day of cohabitation with the stone apatal sentinels proved to be tense. The horde of guardians of the low way reached the great iron door, eventually, the sounds of their bodies and metal weapons bumping up against the gate and testing it echoed throughout the menagerie, adding to the grimness of the place a great deal. Glimmon had wedged a large rock beneath the turn wheel, preventing it from turning to allow entry. Even still, the creatures tested it, obviously aware that it was the mechanism to open the door, that alone was terrifying enough. Argrave had wished to spend the time endearing some of the sentinels to himself. But that proved a difficult task. The sentinels were very clearly wary of him and his companions, and that alone established a strong obstacle in obtaining something important in conversation, naturalness. If he approached them in the heart of their camp and flattered them or otherwise tried to sway them, his intent would be obvious and the opposite effect would be achieved. Argrave believed that though people might say they don't like brown noses, that isn't necessarily true, they just don't like overt, shameless flattery, especially when the intent behind it is obviously selfish. Bearing that in mind, 
Argrave gave the stone epital sentinels and Ossian ample space. He could not deny the powerlessness he felt in this situation was extremely nerve-wracking, but he was confident in his assessment that any attempt to persuade them might be an active detriment. Argrave and his companions were outsiders and murderers, in their eyes, he did not wish to mark himself as two-faced to boot. Even still, Argrave tapped his boot against the ground rapidly, sitting at attention on a large root of a crimson leaf tree. Hate sitting around like this. Annalise lifted her head from her book at Argrave's words. We're wasting time sitting about for some people that might be our enemies. What a terrible situation. MMM, yes, Garm agreed, standing upright on his stake jammed in the ground a fair distance away. At least you have the luxury of standing, of sitting, even. I can do neither. I just have to wait for someone to pick me up, carry me about, like some kind of man baby. An intelligent mind trapped in a useless husk. Perhaps you will grow to be ambulatory, too, like a baby. Argrave said as he caressed his forehead to dispel a headache. Just don't like being on others' time. The Sentinels are weary. Even if they intended to support us, they would need to rest today. They experienced the same journey we endured, and some of them spent the night on watch. Annalise turned her gaze towards their camp. Today? Argrave repeated that word. I don't know if it's night or day. I certainly can't sleep, not with all these people nearby. And that banging. Argrave gestured towards the door. Nothing can ever go smoothly, can it? The vampires are as trapped as we are. The Guardians are enemies to all not just us. It would not surprise me if the vampires orchestrated this, in some attempt to clear their hunting grounds of enemies, Annalise outlined, her calmness returned in the relative quietude and safety of the menagerie. You're right, Argrave shrugged and shook his head. He felt something in his chest and coughed harshly, spitting out an unpleasant glob of what looked to be snot off to the side. Argrave grimaced and turned away quickly, but then froze. They are trapped, Argrave said out loud, looking to Annalise. Locked tight, they fight with the guardians, just as we do he said slowly, as if in revelation. What are you thinking? Asked Annalise, shutting her book. I'm thinking. I have an excuse to talk to Ossian. Argrave stood. And I think I have a way to turn this curse outside our door into a blessing. And it may just be the defining point I need to win the sentinels over to my side. Allow me to explain. Argrave beckoned Gilliman and Annalise closer. Hash. You wanted to speak to me? Said Ossian, his hands held on his hips. He was not alone, but he was present, and that was enough for him. To be fair, Argrave was not alone, either. Annalise and Gilliman were just behind him, the former holding Garm. Argrave might have left Garm back at their camp, but he didn't trust one of the sentinels wouldn't meddle with him as he rested there. Though the severed head wasn't defenseless, it was better safe than sorry. I did, said Argrave. Some of his confident spark returned to his voice. For the first time in a while, he felt that things were going right. So? Ossian held his arms out. Speak, then. Argrave was somewhat dissatisfied by the brusque tone but he began unaffected, I've been doing some thinking, the common problem that unites us, right now, is the mass of guardians just outside our door, and this revelation is what you call some thinking? Ossian said trolly, I trust that's not all, peripherally, though, we both want to deal with the vampires, Argrave carried on as though Ossian had not spoken at all, and I've been thinking, you see, that the two would be best pitted against each other, Argrave said with a smile, Ossian said nothing, so Argrave launched into an explanation. I have in my possession what the Sentinels have lacked for centuries, a key into the lower levels of the headquarters. Argrave pointed to Garm. The vampires think that they're safe in the lower levels, because they're tightly warded by enchanted doors. I say we set the horde of guardians against them. I say we open the doors to the lower levels and leave them open. We let the guardians rush in, tear them apart. And how do you suppose that's possible? The only issue in this plan is that we would need to leave safety, Argrave said. I'm not suggesting that you guys go and do everything for me. I'd lead the charge outside, have no fear. Lead us into a trap, more like, a sentinel at Ossian's side spoke. You have an awfully high opinion of my capability, Argrave noted amusedly. Yes, I'm the master of the low way, capable of setting traps in every corner of this place to lure unwitting paragons of justice like yourself to early graves, Argrave waved his hands about with grandiose sarcasm. Ossian sighed and shook his head. Traps don't need to be set by yourself. The point is, listen, Argrave interrupted. You don't agree, I go alone. Simple as. Argrave shrugged. I hope you're honorable enough, at least, to open the gate for our return. Ha. Huh. That would be worth watching, if only for the spectacle of your inevitable death. The same sentinel beside Ossian commented. Argrave pushed his tongue against his cheek, frustrated by their obstinance. The only reason I let you inside my little sanctuary here was because I was confident I could defend against all of you. A B rank mage, a couple of C ranks. Argrave pointed them out, remembering Garm's insights. I've got my own bag of tricks. Be it all twenty of you or that horde banging on the door. I can handle it, he said calmly, careful to make his words sound like stated fact more than bravado. Ossian snorted in disbelief but did not rise to challenge the statement. If you're willing to come with, I don't see the problem with this idea of yours. The problem lies in that thing your menial is holding, Ossian pointed. You say it opens the lower levels, yet I've never seen that. A fair point, 
Argrave admitted begrudgingly. To hell it is, Garm snarled out. Argrave stepped aside, giving the floor to the severed head. Listen here, muttered descendant of mine, he ranted. The doors to the lower levels of the headquarters only opened to a magic signature registered with the Order of the Rose. Those vampires, bloodlappers and bastards though they may be, are indeed members of the Order of the Rose. They're mere apprentices, but they have access to the basic level. I, too, am a true scion of the Rose, Garm continued. The doors will open for me, if you doubt me. Garm's eyes opened and glowed, and then a burst of flame shot out towards Ossian. The Master Sentinel leapt back warily, but the flames stopped short of where he had been standing. Don't, Garm finished conclusively. Argrave enjoyed the silence that followed, but the entire camp of Sentinels now watched their conversation warily. Argrave stepped forward walking up to Ossian once more. Not sure if that suffices. Maybe you can quiz him on some things only a member of the Order of the Rose would know. Argrave suggested in jest. That thing should be put down. One of the sentinels pointed at Garm. Sentient or not, it can't be controlled, obviously. Like how you tried to put me down, because I couldn't be controlled? Argrave questioned. I don't understand why you feel the need for absolute control. Confine you, not put you down. Ossian corrected again teeth clenched tight in irritation. The point stands. Argrave shrugged. Don't get all pissy with me. I keep trying to help you, and you keep spurning me. We're at a crossroads, the way I see it. Distrust me, and continue fading as you are. Argrave pointed to them as he said so. Trust me, and prosper once more, eliminating the biggest obstacle to your progress into the low way. Ossian turned away, lost in thought. Hash. Gleman turned the turn wheel for the gate to the menagerie, raising it upwards just slightly. Ossian crouched low, peering beyond into the darkness appearing in the door's small crack. Their entire party was silent, everyone listening carefully. Argrave had a spell at the forefront of his mind, ready to conjure, sky sunder, at a moment's notice to blast away any two armed creatures that came scuttling beneath the iron gate. Ossian held his arm out to stop people from advancing further, then held up two fingers. Argrave looked to Gilliman, and surprisingly, the vampire nodded, confirming the sentinel's sense. His observation did not have much time to be doubted, though. A hand shot out grabbing the gate and trying to force it open. The creature raised the door slightly, allowing sufficient time for another guardian to slip through. Each of its eight black eyes darted around independently, looking for a target, before locking on the closest Ossian. The master sentinel stepped back, drawing his sword as he rose to his feet in one fluent motion. Argrave elected not to cast, considering the sheer bulk of people nearby who could do the task without magic. The creature swung its arm, and a flail attached to its hand whistled through the air. Ossian nimbly dodged with a backstep, then placed his foot on the flail's chain once it impacted with the ground. Another sentinel stepped forward, stabbing the creature with a short spear. It grabbed at the spear for a moment before sagging limp with a soundless death. The hand holding the gate struggled to win against Gilliman, who held the turn wheel patiently and kept the door suspended. Ossian crouched and kicked the creature holding the door, then stood. Argrave heard the creature's hands slapping against the ground as it fled. Ossian waited for a time, then said to Gilliman, We can open it all the way. We waited for their numbers near the door to thin, and we were right to do so. None are near. After Argrave nodded to confirm Ossian's order, Gilliman raised the gate up, right down the stairs, through the central hallway, then down the stairs to the right, Argrave outlined aloud, mostly for himself. You've said that plenty, Garm noted from Annalise's hand. She held the head like a staff though it was much too short to meet the ground. You said you'd lead the charge. Ossian turned back to Argrave. One of the spellcasters stepped forward, conjuring a ball of light that illuminated much of the room. At once, guardians on the walls and railings turned their heads, eyes locking onto their party. Dot so lead quickly, Ossian finished. Argrave took a deep breath. Gleman stepped up beside Argrave, grabbing his shoulder. Be calm, he soothed. His deep, grating voice did not make it especially so easy to suggest. Hard to enact, Argrave muttered. After another breath, he stepped out into the central lobby of the headquarters, a thousand black eyes watching him from every corner of the room. Chapter 96 Death in his breath Ossian and Argrave did not enter the headquarters of the Order of the Rose without proper planning. What they intended to do was already established long beforehand, both offering some contributions based on experience. For Ossian's part, he knew how the Guardians would attack. They had all the reckless abandon of a locust plague. They had numbers, and knew well how to take advantage of them. Despite this, they were not unintelligent in their attacks. They had weapons bolted to the backs of their hands, and they knew how to use them effectively. They would lurk in corners or hang off ledges, waiting for an opportunity to capitalize on a mistake or simply surprise an unwitting wanderer. Argrave knew simply that being encircled would be the least ideal situation, and the rough path that they needed to take. Beyond that, he left the strategizing to Ossian. The man was competent, and he could be trusted to see their plan to fruition despite his lack of trust in them. The key in this situation was simply this. A burst forth. They would need to move quickly, never allowing the creatures to obtain an advantageous position. Argrave took the first step forward, Gleman just beside him, sandwiched between him and Annalise. They moved in a steady jog, 
heading across the balcony of the second floor that overlooked the central lobby towards the stairs. The spellcasters working with the sentinels strove to light the place as best they could, uncaring about the attention attracted. They wanted to attract attention, at least somewhat. Gulliman served as the protector, warding off stray attacks from guardians lurking in places unseen. Annalise and Argrave served as the wedge to open a gap. Whenever a group of guardians would block their advance, they would need to use magic to dispel them forcibly. Despite their fierceness, the guardians were light compared to humans. A sufficiently powerful spell would knock them away. Fire, lightning, and wind elemental magic danced through the air, sending the creatures flying. Their initial rush from the menagerie to the stairs proved to be no issue. Yet as the sounds of the elements echoed out across the stone building, fell noises returned, metal grating against stone, flesh slapping against the ground. All signs the guardians heard their advance and already moved to stop it. Progress slowed at the stairs. The guardians climbed up the side, thrusting at the three of them through the railings like wolves, nipping at the heels as a pack. The sentinels, though, moved forward with unity, pushing back against the tide that rose up the stairs. With their parties grouped closer together, Argrave proceeded further once again, careful not to stumble on the stairs. Once Argrave's feet stepped off the stairs and met the ground floor, he thought the anxiety might be relieved somewhat. But looking out across the room only stoked his unease ever higher. Despite the haste Argrave had endeavored to achieve, the creatures already pulled in the central lobby. Gleaming black and gold eyes moved towards them, so numerous they were uncountable. Gods be damned, Ossian cursed, stepping up beside Argrave. There's too many. Cut our losses. We return to the menagerie. Fuck that. Argrave disagreed, panic making his tongue grasser than normal. I'll carve a path. What? Ossian said in disbelief, didn't want to use this at all. Argrave shook his head. He gestured his hand backwards. Don't send anyone forward. Argrave triggered the blessing of supersession. It felt as though his whole being was being flooded, magic welling up from his chest like a spring freed from the rocks. Erratic thoughts about preserving his magic and minimizing his debt vanished to the wind, whisked away by the tornado of panic disturbing his guts. He stepped past Annalise and Gilliman, conjuring a B-rank ward with his enchanted ring to protect them from errant magic. With the central hallway in the distance in his mind, he held his hands out, spell matrixes forming white lightning fiery wolves, spears of ice, and blades of pressurized wind danced out across the central lobby, sending debris and flesh every which way. The entire place became awash with spell light. The sheer sound, sight, and smell of it all consumed Argrave's senses until nothing else occupied his thoughts. He sought out the creature's black eyes as his targets, conjuring spells as an indiscriminate butcher. The sheer sense of power he felt in that moment combated his anxiety, crushing it utterly. He could feel the heat before him, as though he was standing before a blast furnace with hands outstretched. Every bolt of lightning that sounded out resounded in his chest like a giant drum. Spears of ice hurtled forth, meeting flesh or stone and shattering into a fine blue mist. The wind cut all it moved past, setting anything loose within the room in motion. It was only once he felt a hand on his shoulder did our grave remember himself. His ears rung, and he turned to see Annalise mouthing words. As the ringing faded, he made sense of her words. Dot over. We have a path, our grave. Our grave nodded shaking. Yeah, yeah, right, let's. What in the god's name are you? Ossian spoke, looking out across the carnage. Argrave clenched his fists, feeling the leather glove soaked in sweat tight in his grip. He slowly gathered himself as the feeling of invincibility began to fade. If these are C-rank spells, the carnage I could wreak at A-rank? He briefly thought. Not even a minute had passed, and yet he had achieved this. Realizing he left Ossian unanswered, he quickly said, What am I? I'm just in a hurry. Let's go, before more take their place. They are legion. After all, Argrave stepped out into the central lobby, passing the site of carnage. A strange quiet had settled over the place. As he stepped into the site of his attacks, he felt the damage he'd caused directly, the heat beneath his feet, the icy mist in the air, the still spasming guardians writhing with electricity. The blessing of supersession lent Argrave's advance a sense of urgency. He was the first to rush into the central hall. Before long he was joined by Gilliman and Annalise who kept up easily on account of being more athletic than he was. Some guardians stopped their advance. Argrave dispatched them, using the C-ranked lightning spell, Sky Sunder, with reckless abandon, uncaring of how deep he grew in debt to Erlebni. They reached the stairway that led down, and Argrave caught the wall just before it, pausing to catch his breath. Chest feels tight. Think my cardio got worse, actually, he huffed. He looked back, watching the armored sentinels still rush to catch up to them. All right, calm. If this doesn't work, don't let the thought enter your head. Garm assured, breaking his silence from his place in Annalise's hands. Annalise took the first few steps down the stairs. Argrave followed just behind, where ahead, he saw a stone door that shimmered with lights. It was circular and had no handles. You have done your task, Garm said as Annalise stepped to the door. I will do mine. Your presence, now, is, well, overpowering the magic within you. It muttered. I can hardly bear to look at you. Just press my head to the door, sweetie. 
He spoke to Annalise. Annalise did so. At once, a black, flower-like pattern bloomed across the door. It slid to the side. Someone had been leaning against the other side, and they fell backwards. Gulliman mercilessly dispatched the vampire before he had a chance to recover. He looked beyond, watching for more enemies. Ossian stepped down the stairs, leading the other stone apatal sentinels. Gods. It opened. The lower levels. I can't believe. He trailed off. You can't believe, yet you came with us? Garm questioned. We can celebrate at a later date. Did you forget the next part? Argrave pressed, almost having recovered his breath. His inhalations still felt shallow, and he felt some measure of pain. He knew something was wrong but did not have time to address it. Right. Ossian directed one of the spellcasters with his hand. The woman stepped forth, conjuring something, and a hunk of stone moved to block the door from sliding back in place. It would likely not be sufficient for long term, but it was only to prevent the door from moving long enough to allow the guardians to enter. Ossian stepped back up the stairs, watching the hallway beyond. Plenty of guardians coming, following the noise. We enter lead them in, and go to this other exit you talked about. Watch for falling vampires, Argrave said glibly to disguise his own unease, then stepped into the lower levels of the headquarters of the Order of the Rose. The lower levels had the same darkness common on the entry floor, yet here was different. In a way Argrave found difficult to wrap his head round. Rather than simply being dark, it felt like light had not touched this place in a long while. It was mostly free of dust and dirt and had the same elaborate carvings as in this first floor. The hallway stretched on for a long time. Argrave hurried down it as fast as his labored body would allow. Eventually, the hallway opened up into an open space. The room was massive, its ceiling stretching high into the air. It seemed split into halves. The front room was an administrative center, housing desks and reception areas that had long ago been repurposed to the vampire's needs. The other half was blocked off by thick iron bars, and housed a grand library still illuminated by light even after the centuries since the Order's fall. S. Sentinels. A shout echoed out across the room abject terror in the voice unbefitting the vampire which it came from. Go left, ward off attacks, once the guardians get in, they'll screen our escape, more or less, Argrave said to Ossian. Despite his position as the master sentinel of the group, he did not object to Argrave's directive, nodding in quiet agreement. They went left. The vampire's home soon became a veritable hive of activity as the things moved to tackle the situation. Shouts similar to the one that first echoed out filled the place as people adapted to the unforeseen occurrence. Though some vampires tried to stop them from proceeding or generally assault them, the attacks were easily enough repelled. Argrave dared a glance backwards once they were sufficiently far from where they'd first entered. He saw the first of the guardians enter the lower levels. True to Argrave's prediction, they started to flood in great numbers, quickly emerging from the hallway. The vampires that had moved to deal with the sentinels and Argrave's party were quickly confronted by a wave of guardians. Argrave whipped his head back ahead, laughing slightly. He held a hand to his chest once the pain he'd felt earlier reignited. Ahead, there was another hallway. This is the other exit. Argrave wheezed out. What? Ossian said. Having not heard him. The exit's there. Gulliman finished for Argrave. Some joy seeped into Ossian's tone as he said, Gods. This. This is an unparalleled. Argrave broke away from the group, putting his hand against the wall to support himself. He coughed, each one setting the pain in his chest afire. At the final cough, he felt the tang of iron in his mouth, and he spat out blood. Argrave stared at the redness blankly, still short of breath. Gulliman grabbed Argrave's arm. Vade. He cursed. Don't have time for this. I'll carry you. Argrave lacked the breath to protest as Gilliman sheathed his sword and lifted Argrave, throwing him over his shoulder. Ossian paused, looking back. What is he? Just move, Gilliman pointed ahead. Considering all he's done, it's only fair you take the bulk of the burden in the escape. Ossian looked at Argrave, then nodded, moving ahead. They entered into the hallway, where a circular stone door identical in appearance to the one they'd entered through waited. Annalise stepped past the sentinels, opening the door with Garm once more. Beyond. The hallway lay empty. All right, things seem calm. The bulk of the guardians followed us. They'll be dealing with the vampires, Ossian narrated. We just head back into the menagerie. Chapter 97, Selling Air. Gulliman set Argrave up against the wall, while the sentinels behind them lowered the iron gate to the menagerie. It collapsed against the stone, letting out a puff of dust that expanded out across the empty space. Everyone breathed heavily, catching their breath, yet above it all was a short, shallow breathing. Argraves, Gulliman knelt by Argrave. You have a fever. I can smell the blood on your breath even still, along with rot. An infection. Argrave touched his chest, saying nothing. His chest felt painfully tight, and he couldn't inhale as much as he normally could. On the bright side, his enchanted leather gear had made Gilliman's pauldron stick into his ribs less. Ossian stepped forward, standing just before Argrave's foot. I thought you were experiencing some rebound from that display of magic you pulled out earlier, but it seems I was wrong. Argrave coughed a few times. It's got to be. Pneumonia. Though that's a symptom, not the illness. Or is it our? Can't remember what it is. Argrave shook his head, then touched his chest. Pain subsiding a bit. Pneumonia? 
Ossian repeated. I don't know about that. I know what you have, though. We call it red lung. It's caused by some of the plants in Nordmed, though it doesn't bother most people this severely. Coughing blood, pus, trouble breathing. I suspect the physical strain made it worse in this case. It affects mostly children or the elderly. Ossian fixed some of his matted dark hair, having recently removed his helmet. This case, it's quite severe. Probably fatal. Do you know how to treat it? Asked Annalise, urgency evident in her tone. Garm stayed silent in her hands. Ossian nodded. The B-rank healing spell, cure disease, suffices. And you have a B-rank mage. Annalise pointed at the woman in question. If this is so common an issue, surely she knows the spell. She does, Ossian confirmed with a nod. He placed his hands on his hip, moving his sword further back on his belt. None made any moves, standing around our grave in silence. Annalise pointed to the woman once more and said, So, why are we letting him stay like this? Please, treat him. Ossian pursed his lips and stepped away from our grave. I can have him treated. But I have some conditions. He turned his head back. Our grave lifted his head up. Oh, yeah? he asked, some vigor returned to him. Go on, then. You would have to surrender that thing, Ossian pointed to Garm. And moreover, you would have to submit yourself to the stone apatal sentinels for judgment. We would give you safe passage back to the surface. And use your deeds in revealing the vampire's location to us in this judgment, he said enthusiastically, as though lightening the blow of his words by pointing to a bright side. We would keep you under. House arrest, I suppose, not a prisoner, but a detainee. Thereafter, the three of you would be presided over by a council of all the master sentinels. Argrave started to laugh. It broke off into a wet cough. After, he looked up grinning. Blood on his teeth. Can hear the gratitude in your voice. Real heartwarming. I would speak for you. I'm sure most of the other people here with me today would, as well. Ossian waved around, and his words were met with some nods. They didn't seem overly enthusiastic, though. In the sentinels, though, there are rules and orders that have to be followed even by me. I can't simply give you favors for the sake of them. You're a bastard. After my own heart, hey, Argrave chuckled briefly. Let's say, for the sake of argument, I don't want to be held in judgment by people who hate me. What would happen then? Ossian shifted on his feet. Dot I would leave you untreated and return to the Sentinels. That's going to happen very shortly regardless of your choice. Though the Guardians collided with the Vampires, this is an advantage that needs to be pressed. I'm going to return to the entrance of the Low Way and gather more of my brothers to finally wipe the Vampire Menace out of the Low Way, uproot them completely. Ossian. Just leave him? Another Sentinel asked, stepping forth. That's not right. We have them here, we outnumber them. Glimmon stood up stepping forth until his towering presence was made known. Try, he said simply, after some of what you cretins have said, I'd relish the chance to prove why your numbers mean nothing. Easy, now, Ossian said, holding his hand out, and you, he turned back to the sentinel that had spoken. Attack our grave or his companions, I'll kill you myself. Let's not escalate things without reason. I've made my stance known. Wouldn't sit right with me, returning help with hostility. Girl, Garm whispered. Annalise, expression worried, looked down at Garm. I would speak to you, privately. What? she questioned, then stared at Garm's face. He stared back at her, unspeaking. After a time, she nodded, and stepped away. Hash. Behind. The conversation continued tensely while Annalise walked to a distance, planting Garm down in the ground. She was not eager to leave behind the two of them in front of the sentinels, but she was relatively confident things were not yet at the point of coming to blows, simply judging from the states of the sentinels. You're a snow elf, aren't you? Asked Garm, staring up at her. Of a diamond. She corrected. Snow Elf is what humans call us. And your traditions, honor, contracts, loyalty, they remain intact, unchanged? Annalise nodded. They do. I still follow them. Good. Garm looked satisfied, though he was unable to nod. I've been watching you. Watching all of you. I'm not ignorant of my position. I'm a tool, a useful one, but one that each and every one of you is willing and able to discard. What happens to me is beyond my hands. Not that I have them, anyway. He closed his eyes. That be rank spell book you've been reading in the camp. It's the tome for that spell they mentioned. Cure disease. Annalise crossed her arms, saying nothing. After a time, she nodded. It was. I thought something like this might happen. Only. It doesn't matter, she shook her head in defeat. I wasn't able to learn it in time. Garm grunted. From what I have gathered, these stone epital sentinels are not on the best of terms with your group. The idea of going with them is not ideal for precisely these reasons. The way things are shaping up, your friend will die if you do not. Coughing up blood, barely able to breathe, a high fever. Illomans. However, Garm continued, these stone epital sentinels, in comparison to your group, are much less ideal for me. I have been in a haze for so long, my thoughts not my own, and only now have I regained them. I am not one for giving up, I am destined for greatness. I always have been, Garm said with utter confidence. Were I to be surrendered to the sentinels, I would surely perish. Or meet a worse fate. Our grave is more important than you, Annalise said bluntly. If it will save his life, I am sorry, but, 
I know you three have a strong bond, I think, with him at the center of things. Like some kind of sinewy glue. Perhaps willowy might be the better word. What are you, however? I am a high wizard of the Order of the Rose, Garm continued loudly. I long ago mastered a rank magic. This limited husk prohibits me from using higher ranked spells, yet the knowledge remains. Garm gazed up at Annalise. I can help you learn this B-rank spell. I know it. I've used it. I might even use it on our grave, had I the capability. Alas, I am but a head on a stake, and my capabilities are minuscule in comparison to what they used to be. Annalise took a deep breath and looked back towards the group. I understand where this is going. You mentioned contracts, loyalty. At the beginning of this, what would you expect in return? She looked at him. Your freedom? Your safety? I can't have freedom. Look at me. Garm's eyes rolled about in his head. But yes, you are right. I want you to ensure my life. I want you to take me with you out of this hellish place and ensure my continued existence. I was great, once. I will be great, again. I need only the opportunity. Annalise looked down at Garm. You merely want to travel with me? I will ask for no more than my continued protection. I am in the position of weakness now. I have no delusions about this. Garm shut his eyes. But as long as I continue to stay alive, there will be an opportunity. Especially so with people as intrepid, shall we say, as you three. There will come a time when you need my knowledge once more. And then, we will strike another deal. Annalise took a step away, lost in thought. Garm waited patiently, staring up at her. She turned her head back. I cannot decide this alone, you realize. This is our grave's life we speak of. I cannot be its arbiter. He must decide whether or not to risk things. Yet you are amenable to the idea. Garm raised a brow. I am, she nodded. I am at the cusp of advancement, I am sure of it. If your help is as good as you say, I believe I can overcome the barrier to reach B rank. But as I said, then let us bring my idea to our patient, Garm said. Hash. Go on, get. Argrave pointed to the gate. As soon as Annalise had pitched the idea to Argrave, he was more than willing to give the Sentinels the boot. Annalise was one of the fastest progressing spellcasters in Heroes of Berinda, and he fully trusted her capability to reach B rank especially with the help of a high wizard. Annalise was more than a little flabbergasted by his total confidence in her abilities. Without treatment. Ossian cautioned. I am near certain you will die. Even in the best case scenario, your lungs will suffer significant scarring, and you will never be the same again. I've got my own bag of tricks, like I told you, Argrave said, still leaning on the wall. Last time I ever decided to be nice to members of a paramilitary organization. I thought you were one of the decent ones, Ossian, but you were the biggest snake in the grass. Ossian took a deep breath and sighed. But the people behind him seemed somewhat bothered by Argrave's words. Fine. Don't understand how you can be so flippant with your own life, but, I'll honor my words. You've done a good service for the Sentinels. Even if you do not live, you will be remembered. The stone apatal Sentinels moved to the Iron Gate, one of their number moving the turn wheel. Ha, ah, right. Argrave laughed as the gate rose. They started to move outside, one by one. Ossian was the last to leave. He gave quiet nod to Argrave, and then the Iron Gate lowered once more. Glimmon walked forth and wedged the rock beneath the turn wheel ensuring it would not open again. Who? Argrave breathed. Safety. Relatively speaking. You made the right choice, said Garm, stabbed into the ground some distance away. We'll have you on your feet in no time. Argrave clenched his hands tight. Yeah, hope so. Can barely keep my eyes open. This hit me hard. Dot I'll prepare something comfortable, said Gilliman, looking around. Right, Argrave said idly, leaning his head against the stone. I'll be waiting. His whole body felt heavy. He felt a haze growing in his brain, and he slowly surrendered to it. Drifting into darkness. Chapter 98 No rest for the wicked. Argrave grabbed Annalise's wrist weakly. When I die, dot you go see Orion. You'll need his help for the jester, he mumbled. After, you should deal with the war, I think. If you like Orion, help him. If you don't, help the rebels. You're a smart cookie. You'll do it fine. All while Argrave was talking, Annalise was repeating his name time and time again. He didn't seem to hear it at all. Just remember to get Elnor on your side. She's the bat. He continued, slurring. After that, the steps, go there, the centaurs, and the elves, you've got a deal with the malfeasance, and the dryads, side with the centaurs, they're better, cooler, Annalise finally shook Argrave, and his bloodshot eyes came to focus on her, open wide in surprise, Argrave, it is over, you have been treated, you are not dying, he stared for a moment, mouth agape, he smacked his lips together, and his eyes rolled back into his head before coming back to attention, that can't be right, I feel terrible, just let him be, Garm spoke, causing Annalise to turn her head back. That spell drains a lot from the one subject to the disease. He'll probably need to eat and drink a lot before he's back to working order. Even then, his lungs probably have some scarring. Minor, though, and it should heal given time. Annalise lowered him back into the makeshift bed that Gilliman had constructed. Argrave spoke, staring at Garm. What are you? A doctor? An anesthesiologist? He spoke the word incredibly slowly, as though he could barely remember it. Once he laid back in his bed, 
He shifted. Shitty hospital bed. I want to go home. The H.O. wiki is nothing. Without. Annalise looked up at Gilliman. What is he talking about? Doubt anyone could answer that. Gilliman crossed his arms and shook his head. He's delirious. Let him be. We should prepare some easily chewable food for him. Crush those berries, dice some of our rationed meat. Annalise leaned away from our grave, letting out a deep sigh of relief that caused the stress to veritably drain from her face. Her eyes were sunken and bloodshot, with deep dark bags beneath them. I hope you won't forget our deal, sweetie. Now that your little friend isn't one toe into the grave, Garm spoke from behind her. Annalise's expression tensed once more, and she looked back to Garm. I will honor that arrangement, and thank you for your tutelage. Don't expect more. Unless I benefit, somehow. Garm smiled. If you think that's selfish, realize you're speaking to someone worse off than a cripple. She turned her head away and nodded, then rose to her feet. Gleman was staring at her. You should rest, he stated. Hard to tell time here, but I estimate you've gone two days without sleep. Your job is done, and now you must come back to form. I will take care of things from here. Nothing will disturb us. But you must be near devoid of blood. Perhaps I should. Sleep he commanded. Do not be as bad as him about taking care of yourself. Annalise nodded. Wake me should anything happen. You said the sentinels are still clearing out the lower levels of vampires, an unideal time to be found here. I know, Gleman said. Bad for them, at least, after what we did, to be extorted like that. Gleman clenched his fist, his gauntlets creaking against one another. Annalise held a hand out. Please, do not dwell on it. Everything turned out fine. Hash. So. A talking head, huh? Argrave said. His voice was hoarse and speaking still hurt. His mind had gathered somewhat, enough for conversation, at the very least. Most kids bring home a pet, it's something like a dog. Or a cat, maybe, if you're lucky. But Annalise. A head, Argrave outlined, then nodded his head as he let the words hang. Annalise let out a few small laughs through her nose. It had taken some days for Argrave to recover enough to speak, and she seemed to be glad he was back to snuff. Gleman was off collecting some of those berries from the trees. Argrave and Annalise sat near the wall. Argrave well supported by a bed of cloth that Gilliman had foraged from the menagerie. You're pondering this now? Shot back Garm. Argrave scratched his chin. Didn't really have much room for thought when the idea was pitched. Annalise takes the next step on the path of magic. It got me out of debt to the Sentinels. Good enough for me. Argrave frowned. How are we? Going to bring you anywhere. Not exactly easy luggage. You pass through any city gates. The guards won't know how much to charge for the toll three and a quarter? And that's assuming they let us in. The mind makes the man. They charge for four, Garm said bitterly. Yes, very funny. Mock a head on a stake. Do you mock amputees? Cripples? The mentally deficient? Are you merely a classless man, or has the standard of propriety in Vasca dropped so low after my death? Argrave was a bit taken aback, and he frowned, genuinely considering Garm's situation. After a time, Argrave looked him in the eyes and nodded. You're right. It's just so ridiculous. Impossible to even think about. Try living it. Garm said poignantly, picture it, I can't turn my head, the only thing I can do is move what's on my face, if I think there's something behind me, all I can do is wait, maybe conjure a ward to block, any itch, any sensation, I'm powerless, I have to be carried everywhere, Argrave let his imagination wander as Garm set the scene and could not help but shudder, you're right, it's terrible, Argrave raised his hands in surrender, it's just not going to be easy to bring you anywhere, I'd say we pull out the stake, wrap you up in a, a blanket, or something, but even that, what if brain falls out, or, or, Argrave shook his head, dispelling unpleasant thoughts, why is it so strange, Garm questioned, are you being serious, Argrave asked, genuinely unsure, lots of wizards walk about with their necromantic creations, I knew this man, he had, necromancy is illegal, now, Argrave said plainly, finally realizing the culture gap, after the order of the rose fell, their creations started going out of control, and, well, Things have been extremely unpleasant for everyone involved. You've seen this place. Argrave waved his hands around. Every ruin of the Order of the Rose is like this. Everywhere. Garm narrowed his eyes. That doesn't make sense. Unless they all vanished overnight. Something like this. Makes no sense. Garm repeated. Flabbergasted. Annalise looked over at Argrave. Curious for his answer. Argrave looked between them. Then raised his arms up. Why are you looking at me? I don't have all the answers. Garm closed his eyes. Looking disappointed and Annalise nodded as though it was the natural course of things. I can tell you about the last thing that I know the Order did collectively, though, Argrave said, sitting a little straighter. Garm opened his eyes, and Annalise also straightened her posture, both listening intently. The last recorded meeting of the Order of the Rose was called by its last Grand Master, Argrave began. This was when the Southern Tribes were invading the Low Way. He called together all of the High Wizards of the Order to the Low Way, in a gathering now known as the Night of Withering. Argrave's gaze switched between Annalise and Garm. No one knows the purpose of the meeting, or what actually happened in it. But that night, when the southern tribes made it deep into the low way, trying to push into Vasca, 
What awaited them was a river of blood. Everything in the low way was submerged in a great tide of blood. Some drowned, others were torn to bits in the flood, cut apart by debris carried by the tide. Had to be something Grand Master Rastran did. He was a master of blood magic and necromancy, both. Garm contributed. Argrave shrugged. No one knows what happened. Some people say the Grand Master and the High Wizards both gave their flesh to wash away the invaders with blood strengthened by their own magic. Others say they were a victim of their own project and died in the flood just as the southern tribes did. But. There aren't any witnesses. Argrave finished. I. Can't picture the wizards of the Order sacrificing themselves like that to stop a mere invasion. Garm looked down. I don't. We have to move again. Tomorrow. Argrave looked to the door of the menagerie. What? Annalise questioned. Surprised. You are still unwell. Glimmon mentioned the sentinels move to clear out the vampires. Argrave said, gazed distant. They can't get their hands on the unsullied knife. They'll take it back to their fortress. We can't hope to match them there. He looked back to Annalise. You think I want to get up and move around? I feel like death itself. This conversation's killing me, but I like talking too much. Annalise sighed, rubbing her forehead. I'm. If you think there's no other choice. She shook her head. Promise me you won't overexert yourself. I mean. It's a little beyond my. Just promise, she insisted. Argrave met her eyes. He found himself unable to say no, and so he nodded quietly. I think the sentinels and I will have to enjoy another conversation, Argrave said, tightening his hand into a fist. This time, though. This time, I'll be the one stepping on their neck. Hash. Look at this, Alistair spread his arms out. All the knowledge of the Order of the Rose, within eyesight. The vampires stared at this for years, unable to move past. Unable to claim it. Alistair reached a hand forward and tapped between the thick iron bars thrice, where the metal gauntlets met with the invisible barrier, and unable to ruin it, naturally. The important bit is that the vampires are wiped out, don't you think? It took four days, and a lot of lives, but... It's finally done, barring two or three that luckily managed to escape, Ossian said, stepping up beside Alistair. This victory is a lot more important than some ancient library we can't touch. And if we could touch it? Alistair turned his head back. Ossian laughed. You see... This is why I didn't want you to come. You say a bunch of stupid stuff all the time. The vampires have been here for centuries. If it was as simple as that, this place wouldn't be undisturbed as it is. Alistair inhaled sharply, then looked back to the library. Maybe so. But you did something very stupid. You left that murderer roam free. I intend to correct that. Are you serious? Ossian tilted his head. He's the reason we made it here to begin with, and you're going to correct that? That head he has. Alistair looked back. If it's the key to these doors, it might be the key to this library. Argrave said the wayward thorns were mere apprentices in the Order of the Rose, but that head. It was a high wizard, no? There has to be something to that. Even if it can't get rid of this barrier. It definitely knows how to break it. Gods. You're being serious. The man hands us the biggest boon to our knightly order in centuries on a silver platter, and you want to make his life harder than it already is. If, indeed, he's even alive? Alistair stepped up to Ossian. What happened to your bravado? Ossian, you chased after him with the intent to kill, and then you find him and make nice. If Claude were here, I'd petition to have you stripped of your rank. He pressed a gauntleted finger against Ossian's chest. You do this, go to the menagerie, I won't stand for it. Ossian swatted Alistair's hand away. And I won't let you do it secretly during the night, either. All I did, I did for the Sentinel's honor. You, though, I've got no idea what you're thinking. You want to start a mutiny, Ossian? Alistair tilted his head. It's no mutiny. You're not my leader. Ossian said loudly and clearly, this is a joint expedition, for the purpose of wiping out the vampires, nothing more, he emphasized, fellas, no need to argue over me, echoed out a hoarse voice, the two master sentinels turned their heads to the side, where three figures walking beneath a ball of light slowly stepped out of the darkness and into the lower levels, Alistair raised his fingers to his mouth, and despite the gauntlets, sounded out a perfect whistle, at once, all of the sentinels that had been idle came to attention, facing towards the new arrivals, gods, are grave? Ossian said, brows furrowed in confusion and surprise both. Chapter 99, Night of Withering. Argrave stared out, once again, into Nordrade. The bleak and inconstant red light coming from the ceiling seemed a salve for the constant darkness they had been subject to inside the menagerie. Argrave's party had come here only after Glimmon had done significant scouting. Ossian had returned to the fortress in front of the low way some days ago, and returned with a second party, numbering near forty. Amongst them was Alistair. Do you know a very interesting principle about water? Argrave quizzed Annalise, staring out into the distance. Could you ask a vague question? Annalise shot back. Water always runs downhill. Argrave looked at Annalise, brushing her sarcasm aside. Dot I think that is true of most liquids, she said after a time. Very good. Argrave turned his head away, just checking to be sure you knew. She breathed out lightly in some amusement, then pressed. Why are you bringing this up? The canals. Argrave raised a finger pointing at them. They have sluices. They're part of the path that I need to take to get the crimson wellspring, 
Divert the water right, you get a dry path you can take to get up to it. But then, I got to thinking. We opened the lower levels, didn't we? Dotto, she nodded, understanding things. These stone epatal sentinels. They're real nasty people. I was thinking real hard, running things through my head I might say to win them over to my side. And maybe I could. Argrave looked up at the ceiling. But these people. I think I got them wrong from the start. How so? Asked Gilliman. They're cowards, Argrave said, looking at Gilliman. Like you, apparently. Gilliman frowned. I didn't mean that I. Don't get mad. Argrave looked back to the canals. I just mean. They live in fear of the outside, and they live in fear of what's in here. They don't trust anything. Because they're scared. Argrave sighed, then frowned when he felt some pain in his chest. Fear keeps people alive, Garm rebuked. Just let me make my point. Argrave shook his head. You can't reason with these people. Hardly even worth it to try. And. Well, I'm damn tired of acting nice to people who couldn't spare but a single spell for my welfare. The scraping and the bowing. The false flattery. It has its uses, but I think I've been relying on it too much. So you intend to flood the lower levels, kill them? Annalise asked. I don't think that's possible. Despite its current state, this city was well made. Even if the canals overflow, a drainage system will correct things quickly enough. Argrave looked around. I just need to. Well, I've said it. I need to scare them. I know that's possible. I intend to turn their caution against them, especially Alistair's. What do you mean? Glimmon pressed. That one wants to be leader of the Sentinels, no matter what. He needs a good achievement. Wiping out the vampires. That was mostly Ossian's thing, and he's young and bold. I imagine Alistair sees him as his chief competition to replace their missing leader, Claude, as such. Argrave looked at Garm. I imagine he'll want to get into the library, and quickly. Why are you looking at me? Garm asked concernedly. I can't open the library. It was well managed by select order members. Now that they're dead. Well, I can't imagine anyone can get in. Unless they destroy the enchantments entirely. Near impossible to do, you know. Alistair doesn't know what you know. He probably thinks you're invaluable. If you're absent, he won't act against us as easily. He wants you above all, I suspect. You're another card in my hand, he gestured towards Garm. I want a royal flush if I'm betting against the Sentinels this time. Argrave looked to his companions, and all looked confused by the expression. Uh, I mean, I want things heavily weighted in my favor. He elaborated. Garm sighed. I wish people with a sense of self-preservation had found me. He stared up at Argrave. I won't do anything dangerous. Annalise, tell him. You want dangerous? I imagine Alistair will try doubly hard to have us killed if you're present. Argrave ruffled Garm's hair. You stay near the final sluice, and you raise it to start and stop the flooding after a little bit. You'll be safe, don't worry. Dot fine, Garm eventually agreed. Don't forget, though, this is a favor. Yeah, sure. Argrave waved his hand dismissively. I go in. I act bold. I act unafraid, make it seem like I'm in control. After some happenings, some well-placed words, everyone falls into place. So, any objections to this plan, you two? You should elaborate a bit more, urged Annalise. For clarity, all right, Argrave nodded. From the beginning, then, hash. Argrave stood before a group of numerous sentinels once again, with Alistair at their head. Though the setting was entirely different, it brought back some memories. Last time things began like this. They ended very poorly. Argrave was a bit more confident things wouldn't end up the same way. Of course, he didn't come without a way out. He had been very cautious before approaching, Glimmon had confirmed their count, the sentinels numbering 36, and Garm had confirmed there were no mages beyond B rank. Should things go sour, Glimmon was instructed to pick Argrave up and run away. Unflattering, perhaps, but Argrave was confident they could get away easily enough. Indeed, their enemies might not even give chase considering their paranoia of traps and snares. Guess they're right to fear a trap. Not like they can escape it now, though, Argrave thought, using that to assuage his anxiety. Interesting conversation you two were having. Argrave spoke at a fair volume, his voice ragged and rough. He sounded like a chain smoker when he spoke loudly, but Garm assured him that it would change in a few days. His limbs felt weak, taking deep breaths was still painful, and Argrave could not exert himself but he had no choice but to be here. With things as they were, Argrave knew he couldn't expect a warm reception. Despite the many days taken for his recovery, he still felt terrible. But the unsullied knife would still be here, and Argrave would much rather get it now before the stone epital sentinels could take it back to the entrance of the low way. With things having progressed as they had, Argrave had only two options. His first option, he could get the unsullied knife now by dealing with a group of weary, cautious stone epital sentinels who had already seen the power he possessed. They were, further, ignorant of his blessing of supersession's limitations. The second option was to let them have the unsullied knife and get it from their fortress later. In the heart of their power, where near 200 of them would be waiting. In addition, he knew they had at least two A-rank spellcasters at that fort, 
Jin and Kaija, obviously, confronting them here held more appeal. The preparations he had made further sealed that deal. Ossian took his hand off the pommel of his sword. You cured the red lung? How? Huh? I had to unhinge my jaw like a snake, open real wide. Then I stuck my hand deep, past my throat and into my lungs. And pulled the disease out, piece by piece. Argrave emulated what he described, then stepped forward, continuing in his hoarse voice. It took southern grit and a sword swallower's finesse, but I managed. And here I stand. My heart's a beating. My souls are singing. Alistair held his hand out and shouted, Keep your distance. Say please, maybe I'll consider it, Argrave said, but he did come to a stop. He looked about casually as though he didn't care about the armored entourage before him. The place had been filled by the corpses of vampires, sentinels, and guardians. It was gruesome enough that it might have bothered Argrave a great deal. But he was starting to grow used to these sights. Nice work in here. I would say couldn't have done it better myself. But, well, he looked to Alistair, I think you saw the central lobby on your way in, it was very difficult to try and intimidate a room full of knights wearing enchanted armor who were also flanked by spellcasters at the same or higher rank than himself, Argrave was happy enough to have gotten through the sentence without stumbling over his words, part of him expected to be laughed at in unison by the whole group like some sort of comedy sketch, but instead, a long silence settled throughout the lower levels of the headquarters. The shining lights of the library beyond the iron bars grimly illuminated the place. Dot why are you here? Ossian eventually asked, one of few of the stone epital sentinels that did not seem to positively bristle at Argrave's presence. I told you from the beginning, and my purpose hasn't changed. I'm here to reclaim my family's heirloom. Argrave shook his head as though disappointed. Things could have gone easy for the both of us. I could have taken you here, we could have wiped out the vampires together. Yet for reasons beyond me, you decided to move against us as we slept. But, Argrave spread his arms wide. We're here now, having achieved what I initially wanted, despite some significant setbacks. I had to preserve myself, and despite that, I still gave you what you wanted most. I think it would be best for all of us. Argrave's throat failed, and his voice faded away. He paused to take a drink of water. Dot to put the past behind us. His words seemed to dissolve the tension somewhat. Alistair stared at Argrave unflinchingly. He seemed disappointed likely due to Garm's absence. I can't trust you. You were dishonest from the beginning. House Blackguard doesn't even exist, Alistair posited. That's what it was? Argrave raised a brow in surprise. I see. Guess I shouldn't have. Well, it doesn't matter. You want honesty from me? No answer came, so Argrave continued. All right, I'll give you honesty. I am Argrave of Vasca, son of King Felipe III. Don't toy with me, Alistair said, stepping forward. I'm not, Argrave said coldly, pausing to allow his lungs to rest. It was starting to hurt to speak. Everyone should know what their king looks like, a giant of a man, as tall as me, with hair as black as night and eyes a cold, steely grey. Perhaps this light doesn't show those features well enough. Argrave adjusted his position so the light from the library fell on his face. A grim silence settled over as they took in his features. If you're a prince, you'd have an entourage of royal knights, Alistair countered. They are performing certain tasks for me. Argrave shook his head, and it is hard to travel quietly with so many knights. Alistair took a deep breath, thinking. Ossian asked, why not say this from the beginning? Yes, because it would be very prudent for a prince to roam about using his name carelessly when he's in the heart of the territory of an enemy rebellion, Argrave mocked sarcastically, though. With things as they are, I suppose you have a point, things would have gone easier had I been honest from the beginning. Argrave put a hand to his chest. I came here on behalf of my father to retrieve the unbloodied blade. Our family founded the Order of the Rose, and the artifact belongs to us, by rights. What use he was for it, I don't know. But being a prince has its responsibilities. This is nonsense. You make up things to suit your needs, and you lie again, even using the king's name, to bend us to your will. Alistair sliced a hand through the air. Glimmon tapped Argrave's shoulder, that was the cue. Argrave had stalled long enough for the water to come. All right, Argrave nodded with a smile. You don't trust me, that's fine. How about I prove it? Prove it? Alistair repeated. There's no way I can think of. He shook his head. You remember the night of withering? Argrave questioned. Well, stupid question. Of course you don't remember it, but you've probably read about it. Alistair's face hardened. What are you talking about? No one knows the cause of the Night of Withering, or so it's said. The only thing people know is that a tide of blood washed away the southern invaders. There's speculation, of course, but no one knows the real answer. Argrave spoke, stalling for time. When he started to hear rushing water, he sped things along. Well, that's not true. Argrave shook his head. The royal family caused the Night of Withering, flooding the low way with a river of blood killing both the southern invaders and the Order of the Rose. The rushing of water became louder, crashing against the stone walls and echoing into the room. The stone apatal sentinels all shifted uneasily. Argrave stepped forward, raising his hands in the air. Let me lay things out clearly for you. Argrave spoke louder, voice rising above the rushing water. If you refuse me, I will prove my descent. These walls will become awash with blood once more, 
and all within this place will be lost, just as it was near seven hundred years before. If Vasco cannot claim this place, none shall. By this point, red water started to push past our grave's feet and into the room beyond. The swell soon rose further yet, battering at his calves. His grey leather duster blocked the debris carried by the overflow. So, stone epital sentinels, our grave continued. Make your choice, our grave. Ossian shouted out, stepping back. We agree, we'll put things behind us. He shouted in panic. Our grave was a bit taken aback. He hadn't expected an answer to come so quickly. He remained quiet as the tide grew larger yet, approaching his knees. Had the water been moving quickly, it would have been impossible to stay standing. What is Garm doing? I didn't want this much. I'm unconvinced. Argrave returned, trying to earn some more time for the tide to slow. Gods be damned. Ossian cursed. Alistair, just give it up. He shook the other master sentinel. Alistair stepped back deeper into the lower levels, stepping away from the water. He looked shaken, and most of the other sentinels seemed equally shocked by the occurrence. I. Alistair began but trailed off. Argrave faltered a little, and Gilliman put his hand on Argrave's shoulder to stop him from being knocked over by the tide. All right. Shouted Alistair. We'll hinder you no more. Argrave accepted the words in silence, as if divinely ordained. The rush of water coming from behind started to slow, and the red water spread out across the lower levels, battering against the walls. It was quite a messy sight, for the blood and gore caused by recent conflicts had all been stirred by the water. I'm glad we came to an agreement. Argrave smiled a ray of light from the library beyond falling onto his grin. Chapter 100, Unsullied Knife. Argrave stepped through a pool of dark red water, the sound of the sloshing echoing out across the lower levels. The sentinels were near, but they gave the three of them a cautious distance. The disgusting wetness at Argrave's feet made his skin crawl, but he had to bear with it. There was a sense of urgency to his step that spurred his feet forward, yet the persistent taking in his chest made him check his speed. Despite Argrave's grand show of faux power in causing the canals to overflow, what he had created was, in effect, a scarecrow. Upon seeing the ridiculous, people were far more amenable to suggestion. Blooded water flooding the lower levels coupled with Argrave's leading words, his solution had worked for now, but if the sentinels were to examine things closer, they would see Argrave's construction was of straw and wood, not ancient royal heritage as he posited. Are you sure the scalpel will be where you lead us? Questioned Annalise quietly. No returned Argrave happily. Might be things have deviated. The scalpel may have been moved. If that's the case, we will be in an unfavorable position. Deviated, Annalise repeated. Interesting word. It implies a set course. Argrave looked at Annalise. You know another interesting word? Deviant. Stop making me out to be one. And stop being one yourself, while we're at it. Annalise laughed quietly, and Argrave felt some his tension dispel with their light banter. He took a deep breath, wincing when his lungs ached, and soldiered on. Some of the sentinels are watching us. Glamour noted. They were assigned to do so by Alistair. The remainder are giving us a decent distance. Argrave nodded, directing his companion, keep me posted, as they proceeded further into the lower levels of the Order's headquarters. The water level slowly dissipated until the only sound echoing out was the squishing of their wet boots against the stone. They kept a respectable pace, heading into the right hallway. Argrave's spell light illuminated the path ahead. After proceeding down the hallway for a time, an opening to the side revealed stairs descending lower yet. Argrave took them keeping a steady pace and ensuring he kept his hand on the handrail. He wanted to rush, but his feet were heavy with water and he didn't want to strain himself. The sights down the stairs were untouched by the water. The fresh corpses of guardians, vampires, and sentinels littered the place. Argrave did his best to ignore them and press on. Has to be at the farthest point, doesn't it? Argrave muttered to himself. The rooms they passed by had once been places of study, but years being the sole home of the vampires in the low way had made those origins almost unrecognizable. There were strange paintings on the walls, with a crudeness likened to what one might see in Neanderthalic cave paintings. They were very obviously made of blood. Some were calendars, while others were strange depictions of people and the sceneries of the low way. In the game, they had merely been undetailed textures. Now, though, some of the paintings were unimaginably detailed, as though made by an artist who'd had hundreds of years to perfect the craft, and indeed, some of the vampires may have been creating these crude paintings for a time as long as that. But despite the quality of the art, something could be seen beneath each painting a strange sense of twisted savagery. It reminded Argrave of an exhibit he had seen once, artwork made by the mentally ill. Regardless of what was conveyed by the paintings, knowing who had made it twisted his perception. Beyond that, other oddities filled the halls, sculptures, wood carvings, artwork all an innumerable in count. Each were hobbies taken up by the vampires to pass the centuries. They were all wrong in some varied ways. Faces on sculptures were twisted, for instance. They were alien in the sense that they didn't seem to be made to appeal to human emotions. Argrave noticed, though that Gilliman's eyes lingered on many of the pieces for an especially long time. Perhaps there was something intrinsic to the art that appealed to the vampiric condition. Regardless, Argrave was glad when they turned the corner, and he saw the door he was looking for just ahead. Argrave prodded Gilliman, 
pointing to the door. That's our destination. Dot right. The elf responded after an unusually long pause. He had to tear his gaze away from a statue. He moved forward hastily, grabbing the door and pulling it open. He looked around for adversaries, then motioned Argrave in. Argrave entered the room, spell light illuminating the place. The scene was not familiar. There was an altar in the center, but it had been overturned by three bodies, a vampire grappling with two guardians. All three seemed to have died together. One of the guardians had been torn in three and scattered, while the other impaled the vampire through the head with a spear. Remnants of spells lingered in the room. Frost most prominently. No. Argrave said despairingly, walking towards the overturned altar. He saw a glass display case with a velvet cushion that had been splayed out across the room. He kneeled down, picking up the box and looking about. Come on. Where? Argrave looked through the glass, searching for a white knife. Behind him, Annalise noticed something, and bent down to pick it up. She raised it into the air. Argrave, she spoke. He turned when his name was called. Annalise held the white scalpel in two fingers its blade no larger than Argrave's thumbnail. It shone with red inscriptions, like glistening rubies embedded in elaborate weaving patterns. Ha ha! Argrave said excitedly, stepping forward. He held one hand out, and Annalise gingerly handed the thing over. Be careful, I can. Feel it, she cautioned in a quiet murmur. Argrave looked her in the eyes, then delicately took the scalpel. And indeed, she was right. He felt a resonance coming from the blade, like the repulsion from a magnet near another magnet. In this case, though, the scalpel seemed to reject everything that was not itself. The unsullied knife, Argrave said, taking a deep breath. Despite the pain in his chest, he felt a rising triumph. Now, we can finally start getting the hell out of here. He clenched the handle tight. Hash. An innkeeper cleaned a wooden flag and far too thoroughly, scrubbing it clean with a washcloth. As he stared up at the roof, his face was cautious and tense, as though whatever lay on the second floor made him greatly uneasy. There was a rhythmic tapping sounding out and each time it came a little bit of dust sprinkled out into the empty first floor. The innkeeper could not know, of course, that the man in his room was not merely some well-armored entourage. The heir to the throne of Vasca had gone through great lengths to remain in Elbrail without drawing attention. No, the innkeeper merely knew that there was a very angry, and very dangerous person on his second floor. In Duna Vasca held his head in one hand as he sat at a table. His royal knight escort stood before him, silent, as he tapped his foot against the floor. They were tense as though expecting punishment. My accursed brother, he said, nodding his head. He's the reason I'm still here, doing what I am. And I had to learn this second hand. And Dune lifted his head up. None of you were able to find out this information. No one knew that my half-brother, and Dune tapped his chest, brokered the alliance between Jast and Parban. None of the royal knights said anything, standing silently with heads lowered and arms behind their backs. And Dune nodded, tapping his fingers against the table. Wasn't Orion. Wasn't any of my other half-brothers, Levin, Magnus, none of them, no. In Dune wagged his finger, no. It was the half-dead bamboo shoot, the weak-quilled one, the weak-bodied one, about as strong as a twig. In Dune laughed and shook his head, feeling as though the entire situation was ridiculous. That's my sworn enemy. The prince's laughter grew to a crescendo, and then In Dune continued grimly, he's dedicated himself to setting the road ahead of me aflame. In Dune nodded, gazed distant. Should have strangled him there, right in Mateth. And Dune raised his hands up, emulating what he described. Choke him till those beady eyes pop out of his head. Fed him to rats. And Dune closed his eyes and took deep breaths, evidently trying to calm himself. After a long time had passed, And Dune turned his head over to the knights. Sephirian, take off your helmet, step up, he gestured with his hand, then rose to his feet. The knight in question stepped out cautiously, removing his helmet slowly. He was an older man, a grizzled veteran, with a scar across his face. And Dune walked up, towering before the man. Is there anything you want to say to me? The prince waved his hand between himself and the knight. My. My prince, the knight said, unable to meet Endune's gaze. I am not sure. Endune raised a hand up and grabbed the knight's face, pushing the man's cheeks together ungracefully like he was a small child being punished by his parents. Enough of this tiptoeing around. I know you work for my sister. I thought it was cute. Her little spying mission. And you never hindered me, so I kept you around. Now. It's different. She knew about this. She could have reached out. But she didn't. Severin raised his hands up, clearly wanting to grab Indune's wrist but unwilling to touch the prince's body without permission. Indune raised his other hand and pointed it at Severin's face. Right now, I've got the temptation to go and find that bastard and smash his face into ten thousand pieces, like I should have done months ago. The prince released his grip and pushed Severin away in one motion. The knight staggered, then moved his cheeks about, dispelling the feeling. But I won't. I've got the urge. And I won't. My business here in Elbrail is just starting. I can't afford to leave. And Dune placed his hand on Severin's shoulder. But here's the point to remember. I want satisfaction. I want my sister. 
to deliver my retribution. I'll set aside my impulses, my urges, if she can prove to me that it's worth my time. Severin looked up at Indune and slowly nodded. So, next time you go to your little secret meeting, we'll deliver your secret letters. And Dune tapped Severin's chestplate thrice. You get this to her. I expect some good results. Elsewise, well. And Dune trailed off, and then stepped away. I'll have to reevaluate the role of her advice. And Dune stepped to the window, peering out into El Brill. Despite the night, the city was well lit by expensive magic lamps that showed smooth cobblestone roads. But I'll put this behind me, for now. If Duke Maroch is unwilling to support me, then his dukedom will rot from within, and another will take his place. I will not let what is mine be taken from me. And Dune said teeth clenched, least of all by any brother of mine. My mother died giving birth to me. I killed her, and Dune turned back to Sephirin. And I can kill my kin again. Tell my sister that. If you like this audiobook, subscribe the channel for more videos like this. And join my Patreon if you want to support me, where you can find the complete collection. Jekyll Among Snakes audiobooks. Hurry up, what are you waiting for? Leave some comment and let me know if you guys like this story or you have a web novel you like and want to hear its audiobook, I will be happy to create them for you. Please like, share, and leave a comment on the video.